Um, my name is Suzanne Hardy and I'm from Newcastle University in the northeast of England. I work in the School of Medical Sciences Education Development and previously have been a senior advisor for the Higher Education Academy Subject Centre for Medicine, Dentistry and Veterinary Medicine. I've been involved in several OER projects. The first one was in the uh, OER Phase 1 pilot projects and we had a project called Organising Open Educational Resources with 18 institutions involved. Um, that was quite a big project and quite difficult to coordinate but it gave us a really good um, grounding in what the particular problems were in healthcare education which is where we were coming from specifically with that project. That led on to Portia which was Pathways to Open Resource Sharing in Healthcare Education through Convergence in Healthcare Education sorry um, and that one was a collaboration between the University of Newcastle primarily and um, the London Deanery and enabled us to explore in some detail some of the project problems that had come out of the phase one project. Um, the particular ones that were of interest through collaboration with the London Deanery were the differences in um, NHS and academic settings and looking to explore issues of consent more. That was something that had come up quite a lot. Um, concurrently to that one, we had a project called ACTA, which was one of the OMAC projects. Um, and we've recently been funded through phase three to do publish OER. Um, so that one's just about, to, well, it's, it's underway now, and that one's working with publishers to explore how we can look at content from publishers and how that might be incorporated more easily into open educational resources. I think what's special in head healthcare education is that there are two things that are special. The first thing is that we work across both NHS settings and academic settings on a day-to-day -day basis. So students aren't always based on campus and staff often have more than one role. They can be academics who have an honorary contract to deliver clinical work in the NHS. Conversely, they can be clinical people employed by the NHS with an honorary contract to deliver education for universities. And that gives us all sorts of problems of access as, uh, for a start. Um, the NHS net and Janet are separate networks. Um, there is an N3 gateway that bridges across the two of them. However, the priority of the traffic across that gateway is always patient-centered, so education falls down the list. Um, the other thing that's particular to clinical education and medicine dentistry and veterinary medicine is that we have the involvement of patients in the delivery of education and the recordings of patients are used quite extensively in healthcare education and therefore we didn't just have issues of IPR and copyright to, um, to deal with and we had the same issues as everybody else with those. Um, people were applying CC licences wrongly, they were unsure about what they were, they didn't know who owned the copyright to their materials and that's replicated equally in both the NHS and in academic settings. But we also had the additional challenge of thinking about um, Schedule 2 of the Data Protection Act and how that affected consent for patients who had given their permission for recordings to be used of them in healthcare education, but possibly hadn't given their permission or consent for those recordings to be used more widely and shared outside of the immediate setting that they were originally intended for. So that's, that was a, a big area that needed exploration, I think, for us. Some of the IPR and licensing challenges that we've faced in the projects that we've done so far in medicine, dentistry and veterinary medicine have, um, I think, probably been similar to, to other people's. We have the same problems in that people don't, don't know which content is theirs, they can't remember where the content came from. We have problems of orphaned works that we haven't a clue where they've come from, but they're still on the VLE somewhere. Um, there are the challenges that material might have been openly licensed incorrectly and uh, is therefore shared when perhaps it shouldn't be and we can't of course revoke those licenses so there was some 
challenges in trying to find out where that stuff had originally been made. If it's NHS licensed materials, often the department where it was originally created because of the numerous shake-ups that have happened in the NHS over the years has actually disappeared. So it's quite difficult to find the person who originally commissioned that material or who made that material. So some of that material was, was really challenging to, to find out where where the rights lay with it. Um, the issues of consent, which aren't directly to do with IPR or copyright, but we kind of think of them in a third strand when we when we talk about at the projects that we work with, because it's very difficult conceptually to divorce the ideas of IPR and copyright from the issues of consent, um, because the person who made the material that might have a clinical recording of a person in it has the copyright, but there's an ethical question there. And I think the ethical side is something that's um, been more easy to explore in healthcare related projects. However, I think the issues of consent go beyond healthcare education and they're, they're very um, pertinent to everybody. In fact, if we think of it as a continuum where we have um, patients at one end of the continuum who are protected by Schedule 2 of the Data Protection Act um, and we have performing rights at the other end of the, of the spectrum um, where actors and performers are protected by performance legislation. But there are people in the middle and uh, they're becoming increasingly aware through the media that their images can be reused and used and images of them can be captured and used in things like news broadcasts or appear on things like Facebook without their consent. And so there's something about the ethics of whether that's right or not. And of course, we're all people and sometimes we're, we're all and sometimes we're patients. So we have extra rights when we're patients that, that disappear again when we beget, when we become well. Um, plus the fact that patients, when they give their consent for recordings to be made of them in a clinical environment, are often quite vulnerable and, and may not be very well. And therefore, when they're well again, they may change their mind about whether they want that whether they want that material to be to be used in education or, or shared. It's very rare that that happens. Um, most patients are incredibly supportive of, of having their material used in medical education, and they want to help other people. They want other people to benefit from from the service that they've had from from their clinicians, and they they're very aware of the fact that education has to happen and, and their involvement is crucial in it. But there are occasions when, for example, somebody might die and, and the family would want the material taken down. And therefore, there's another ethical side to the, another question that, that we might want to explore there. So I think ethics and consent are something that have been particularly uh, pertinent to, to the, the clinical education OER programmes that we've been involved in. So in order to overcome the challenges that the OER projects that I've been involved in have faced around consent and copyright, we have used the tools that have been provided and developed during the course of the projects um, and the IPR support um, toolkits have been really helpful in that. Um, there are other, tool, other tools that have come from elsewhere. So, for example, the General Medical Council released some new guidance on making and using audio and visual recordings of, of patients, um, which wasn't incorporated into any of the other IPR and copyright tools. And therefore, we felt a need to bring all that kind of guidance together. So we created our own toolkit, which we call the Risk Kit, um, which is to help people evaluate the risk in their learning and teaching materials and it also incorporates all the stuff around consent and what to do if you've got um, recordings of people or recordings of animals in um, in your learning and teaching resources and they might not be necessarily be patients, they could be other members of healthcare staff, other members of academic staff, other, other students, families, carers, all kinds of things. So what to do when you've got those people and also what to do with cad cadaveric materials um, Again, that's not covered anywhere else. Uh, it's quite easy to know what to do with cadaveric materials. You don't share them. But um, the rest of the al alive people, there is a lot of guidance incorporated into the risk kit, which, which also incorporates the guidance from, from JISC Legal and the tools that they've funded and the places like the General Medical Council. So what we've tried to do is to bring that all together. And we're, we're still constantly updating that because we, we think it's important to do so.
I think the OER IPR support team tools have been absolutely invaluable in helping us put the risk kit together. We use the um, decision support well, for the decision support risk kit which we developed we use the workflow diagrams that had come out of the uh, of the OER IPR support team and we also use several of the templates um, we looked at the model release letters and things like that and uh, they've helped us form the basis for the kind of patient consent materials that we've developed from those in in the risk kit without the stuff that had gone before um, through web to rights and OER IPR more latterly, I don't think we would have been able to develop the kits that, that we have. As well as working with ideas of consent, um, we really wanted to come out with something practical. And so Jane Williams from the University of Bristol, who worked with us on both the UER project and on Porsche, um, we were, Jin and I were asked to go down to the General Medical Council to help them with their new version of making and using audio and visual recordings of patients. Um, one of the biggest outcomes, I think, of those two projects has been the fact that learning and teaching is actually explicitly mentioned in that GMC guidance. What came out of that was another project funded by the JISC um, via a workshop that was held back in November 2010 um, to bring together a task force to look at how we might put together some guidance that went beyond the simple GMC guidance, which in itself is useful, but uh, there is other stuff out there as well from places like Welcome Images, the Institute for Medical Illustrators, which are bodies that are well respected within the areas that we work in, in healthcare education. But, the, but it was quite disparate, all that material was quite disparate. And so the task force, which was run from and via the Strategic Content Alliance of the JISC, um, brought together people from the MedEv Subject Centre where I work, Jane Williams from Bristol and some clinicians from Bristol who she's done a lot of work with IPR and consent on, uh, Welcome Images, the Institute for Medical Illustrators and the General Medical Council and we put together some, some guidance in the form of a, of a toolkit which is available from the JISC digital media website and that's something that uh, doesn't exist anywhere else and without those projects I don't think the Strategic Content Alliance would have been able to have funded that, that material. Um, there's still a lot of dissemination to do on it but I think that together with the new guidance from the JMC we're really proud that they came out of the, the OER projects that were funded through the UK OER programme and really pleased that we were able to extend that funding from beyond that programme into the work that the Strategic Content Alliance does. Mm -hmm.